All right, tonight we're going to be talking about Christian liberty and law. These three chapters, I wish every church would memorize these three chapters. It is the, the way you handle all difficulties within the church or differences of opinion about things between Christian people. And so as we study this, we're going to be talking about Christian liberty, how we have liberty in Christ, but we're going to be talking about a number of principles that are given in these chapters of how you actually are able to, to make decisions when you, when you differ on the way things should be done or the way you feel uh, that things should be done. I want to start with, our, with one of my favorite verses in all the Bible, and one that's in this scripture. It's in chapter 10, verse 31. It says, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Doesn't matter what, if you're going to work, going to school, uh, doing your family duties, whatever it may be, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I tell you, if we would do that, this church and every church would be a different place. The, your family would be a different family. And so keep it in mind. A wonderful verse, one that you should memorize and certainly remember. Now, the issue of determining who's right, who's wrong in a struggle over Christian liberty is not an easy one. Uh, over the years, decades of pastoring churches, uh, there's always been people on different sides of every issue who had an opinion about how this should be done or that should be done. <clears throat> and those opinions many times are based on how we were raised or what we've come to know or perhaps just an opinion. And so consequently, a lot of times churches will carry that to the nth degree or Christians will, so much so that they go through a time of being mad or won't speak or the church is divided over things that are issues and not convictions. You know what a conviction is? A biblical conviction is something you would die for. Like if you tell me you can't read the Bible, I would die over my Bible conviction that I believe God wants me to read his word. But if you say, well, I believe that no, no Christian should wear purple, that's an opinion. That's not a conviction. That's just something you believe in. And consequently, you're, you're welcome to your opinion. Well, the issue of determining uh, who's in the right when there's a struggle, like when you're arguing over something silly, like what color the wall ought to be, or something that doesn't really have any Bible commands to it. Whenever there's a struggle about Christian liberty, it's very difficult. First, we, there's two things I want you to know that, the reason, that, that make this difficult. First of all, you have to determine if the issue is truly one of liberty or if it's one of righteousness and sin. So somebody said, well, you know, it's your, it's your opinion that, that I shouldn't do this or do that. And I said, no, the Bible says, and there's a scriptural mandate on how we, should, how we should act. And so when the Bible dictates that something is right or something is wrong, it becomes a, an issue of sin or it becomes an issue of righteousness. But a lot of times people will fight over things that have nothing to do with the Bible. It just has to do with personal opinion. Style of music is one of the biggest ones. Well, I'm Southern Gospel. You sing Northern Gospel and I'm going to leave the church. Or, you know, just all kinds of things like that. They, they, they argue and fuss over the simplest of things. That's my seat. What are you doing in my chair? I've been sitting there for years and on and on it goes. And so we find that most of our struggles come not from righteous things or sinful things, but just basically from things that we have an opinion about. And so people fight over that. So that's the first thing you have to determine when, when you're fussing together or you, are, you have a difference. of You have to first of all determine, is this a matter of righteousness and sin? Or is it just a matter of the way I feel about it? A personal preference. A preference versus a conviction. A personal preference is something you wouldn't die for. A biblical conviction is something that you would give your life for because you know the Bible tells you that that's what you should do. So that's the first thing you have to do. You have to decide whether this issue is one of righteousness or sin or just 
one of uh, an issue that you have an opinion about. But here's the second thing. The second thing when it comes to this matter, you have to determine who's the stronger brother and who's the weaker brother. And we're going to be talking more about that as we go along. Some Christians assume that the person with the most stringent convictions is the strongest brother or sister in Christ. And the one willing to explore frontiers of liberty must be the weaker brother. But that's not always the case. That's not always the case. Folks, listen, sometimes the stronger brother is willing to, li to limit his liberty for the sake of the weaker brother. And we'll be talking a lot about this as we go along. Yet this isn't universally true. As we learn from Paul, if you read Galatians, especially in Galatians chapter 2, Paul talks a lot about giving up certain things to keep weaker brothers and sisters from stumbling. If I broke down outside a bar, I wouldn't go in the bar to make a phone call. Because sure as the world, David would drive by and he'd see me walking in the bar and it'd make him go back to drinking. <laughs> I might uh, be in there drinking already. You might already be inside and I'd run up on you. But the reality is there's certain things, you know, First Thessalonians says to abstain from the appearance of evil. So these are things that we do for people who could stumble if they see us even in a, in a, in a way that's completely different than what they determine, uh, see us in a light of doing what maybe they were saved out of. And we're going to talk more about that as we go along. So when important principles related to the gospel were at stake, when Paul said, this is a principle that could affect somebody getting saved. If I do this, somebody will turn their back on, you know, think of churches that will fuss and fight. If you would just realize that somebody out there is going to hear about it and they're going to use it as an excuse as to why they're not going to come to the church and why Christians are hypocrites, you probably wouldn't fuss and fight over the color of the curtains you want to hang up on the, on the church windows. And so we see that when it came to this matter of the gospel, for the gospel's sake, Paul willfully uh, went against... Um, his biblical sensitivities, in other words, as we grow in the Lord, we learn that certain things we just don't do because, uh, because they don't draw people to Christ. Okay? He, he went against those, and he went against, a lot of times, against his Jewish friends uh, for the same matters. Now, we must study verses 8 through 10 of 1 Corinthians. We must understand it, and you must jot down some of the things we're going to look at. Lord willing, I want to cover chapter 8 and chapter 9 if we have time. I want to spend a lot of time on uh, what we learned from chapter 9, but also especially chapter 10. Now, I want to start out where Paul starts out. He addresses the problem in verses 1 through 8 of chapter 8. He addresses the problems that they were having. Let me start out with verse 1 and 2. He says in verse 1 and 2 that knowledge alone is inadequate. What does that mean? Well, let's look at verse 1 and 2. In verse 1 he says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet he ought to know. Now, the Corinthians, and I, I, I have to give you some background. You know, the Bible is a Jewish book, and the more you know about Jewish customs, the more, and, and the customs of the day when Paul was ministering, the more you'll understand where he's coming from. Because anytime you study the Bible, you have to determine who he's writing to, what he's saying, and what that would mean to the understanding of the people that were reading it. And then how does that apply to me? Those are the rules of biblical interpretation. So Paul is writing to them. And the Christians in Corinth had sent Paul a letter and asked him this question. Was it right or wrong to eat food that had been sacrificed to idols? You see that in verse 1. You see that in verse 4. Was it right or wrong? Now, let me give you a little background. Some of the Corinthian believers reason that it didn't make a bit of difference if they ate food that had been offered to idols. 
People would go into the, into the temple of the idols and they would sacrifice a leg of lamb or whatever. And then the Walmart people would come and, and buy it for cheap, take it out to the uh, table out on the street and sell it for a reduced rate. Well, the Christians would come along knowing that those idols were not real and yet they could get that leg of lamb at half price out on the street. So they were going out buying the leg of lamb on the street at the reduced rate, even though it had been sacrificed in the temple of the false idols. So, so these Christians, some of these believers reasoned that it didn't make a bit of difference if they ate food that had been offered to idols. Makes sense, doesn't it? It doesn't make a bit of difference if they ate the food that had been sacrificed to idols. After all, they knew that the idol gods didn't even exist. But some of their Christian friends, now please get the picture. Some of their Christian friends, however, held a very different opinion. They had been saved out of the idolatry. They had been saved out of the false religion. They had been saved out of the worship and bringing the leg of lamb to, the, to, those, to those idols. They were real gods to them. And they got saved out of that. Now, having worshipped those idols before they trusted in Christ as their Savior, these Christians felt that it was just wrong to eat the meat that had been sacrificed to these idols. And their conscience wouldn't let them do it. They couldn't in good conscience go out and buy the leg of lamb at the table out on the street because they knew where it was coming from. So they had trouble with it. Uh, now that's an important thing to keep in mind. Obviously, knowledge alone didn't solve the problem. They knew, after they got saved, they knew what? It's not a God. The idols didn't exist, right? They knew it. But the knowledge alone didn't solve the problem for the church. It just puffed up the Christians, verse number one. It just puffed up the Christians. Thinking that they knew a lot, the Corinthians failed to comprehend how much they still learn, needed to learn uh, to skillfully use their knowledge. Look at verse two, how they could skillfully use that knowledge in relationship with other people. So we come to church. And Terry says, well, I, you know, I'm going out here and I'm going to buy a leg of lamb on the street because I can get it 50%. And Mac was saved out of idolatry and he, he had sacrificed that and it just bothered him that they were even selling it out there, much less anybody was buying it who was a Christian. What's Mac going to do? Is he going to fuss and fume and cause a fight? Is Terry going to say, well, it's none of your business. I'm on a limited budget and I have to buy cheap meat? No, we've got a real problem here, a real dispute based on, I mean, the knowledge is there, both Terry and Mac know that there's no such thing as an idol. But in Mac's conscience, because he, he was saved out of idolatry, Mac says, this is wrong. We shouldn't have anything to do with what's been in that temple. Everybody follow me? Okay. Now, we see that in verse 2. So in order to understand this entire section, it's essential, it's important that we recognize the value that Paul places on individual conscience. I've had a counseling center for 27, 28 years. I, I used to do all of the uh, HR work for companies like Kachashiro, which is now Advanced Steel, and, and other of the Kabuto and whatnot. And I used to say that the guys at some of these plants who put bars on the, wheel, on the windows would look right at home. They were pretty rough. Guy would come in, he was all, he couldn't get over his depression. Couldn't get over his depression. And, I, and he had been to doctors, he had been to psychiatrists. And, so, and I asked him, I said, tell me about your raising. How were you raised? And he said, well, I was raised in a very strong church of God background. And I said, tell me about that. Well, you know, women didn't wear pants and, and you know, there wasn't divorce and this and the other thing. And I said, now, tell me how you're living now. Well, I'm living with my second girl. I said, you married? No, nope, not married. I'm just living with women. And I said, your problem is not medical. Your problem is, your, if you, and he told me he'd become a Christian. Uh, 
But he, I said, your problem is that you're sinning against your conscience. You know what's right and wrong. You know how you were raised. And the very thing that you're doing is wrong, and you know it's wrong, but you continue to do it, so it's bringing on depression. It brings on the feeling that, that, you can't, that you're no good, and, and I could go on and on. So many times, the problems people have Many times it's because of the anger they're still holding or because of the lifestyle that they're living, knowing full well that they were raised better than that, right? So here we've got, Paul says, and, and again, let me state this. He puts a great big premium on individual conscience. Now, Mac came out of the, out of the idolatry and worshiping idols and all that. And I'd probably be like Terry. I'd buy the meat for cheap. I've been in the ministry too long. But here's the problem. It would be affecting Mac. It would be throwing him for a loop. It would keep him from being able to do what God wants him to do. Because it would be sinning against his conscience. If you want another passage where Paul deals with this, you could read Romans chapter 14 and sinning against your conscience. So the conscious has often been compared to an alarm system that alerts people to things, uh, to the fact that a thought or an action is violating the standards that's, that their conscious believes. I mean, truly believes. Certain people believe things. Mac knows that idols aren't real. Terry knows idols aren't real. But in Mac's mind and his heart, the way he was raised, he was saved out of all that. He doesn't want to have anything to do with that. It offends him to be around it, you see. And so he can't understand why Terry would buy that meat. Why Terry would do those things. And so here, your conscience is a thought or an action. And when you violate that, you're violating a standard that is set within you. Your internal clock, a weak conscience, which Paul talks about in chapter 8, verse 7, and verse 10, and verse 12. A weak conscience will malfunction by alerting the person over wrong things that are not really wrong. All of a sudden, they just stay discouraged because they're, they're feeling bothered by things that are not in themselves wrong but they are things that drew them into a sinful lifestyle before they got saved. A, a, a seared conscience, which is something Paul talks about in 1 Timothy chapter 4, is, uh, is a conscience that no longer works correctly because you've sinned against it and sinned against it and sinned against it to where you don't even, you don't even feel it bother you anymore. And Paul said, I'll do everything to keep from my conscience being seared. So every believer, and I want you to listen, every believer should endeavor to strengthen their conscience. Strengthen it by building it up in the Word of God so that your conscience operates properly. You know what is really sin and what is really just a personal preference. It'll operate properly. It, It'll sound an alarm when the person is actually committing a sin and not just something that they believe in their heart to be true, but there's no Bible basis. Since no Christian conscience is infallible, nobody should attempt to force their views on another person. Max shouldn't go up to Terry and say, you cannot buy that meat. That's wrong. I believe it's wrong. I don't know why I believe it, but I believe it. So don't buy it. That's trying to force how you feel on somebody, and it's not a biblical conviction. All right? Now, we shouldn't be, because we don't know everything. We don't have a handle on all the rights and wrongs. You follow me? We shouldn't try to force our views on another person, unless those views are directly taught in the Scripture. I get people in the office, preacher, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And, and I could go into all kinds of specifics, but I won't. And I will not answer them. I said, I cannot give you a Bible reference 
that deals with that. But here's a principle to help you make up your mind. And one of the principles is, what's that going to do to people that are watching your life? Right? I always use the illustration, I don't cut grass on Sunday. I got another one now. Dale came to me in church. He said, Preacher, you have a high standard and standing in this community. I and my grandchildren were awfully disappointed when we rode by the house this week and saw you cutting the grass in your T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and I caught you too. <laughs> they caught me in my T-shirt. I said, well, if you saw all the dirt that was kicking up, you'd probably <laughs> cut the grass in your T-shirt too. <laughs> Every Christian is a believer priest under Christ is given the dignity of determining in their own mind on questionable uh, matters. Now, I'm not talking about scriptural matters. I'm talking about questionable matters. Now, that takes us up to the heart of the tension that was in the Corinthian church when we come to chapter 8. What, what do we do when Christians differ on matters that seem important to them. Now, remember, I didn't say these were biblical. I said these are matters that are important to them. Like music, right? Now, I'll fight you over music that's Jesus is my boyfriend type music. I'm, I'm not much for that at all. If you don't know what I'm talking about, listen to some of the stuff that's being sung in churches these days. But the reality of it is, so many times churches will divide just over the use of a hymn book. Some want the red hymn book. Uh, some want shape notes. If you know anything about music, some churches think that if it's not shape notes, that, that it, it can't be scriptural because it must have, the, the hymn book, the old church hymnal, got let down from heaven and it has shape notes, triangles and squares. And so they'll fight over that. Virginia, you know what I'm talking about. Well, shape notes versus the hymnal that you have that has the notes printed on the staff and whatnot. I minister to the Appalachian people. They have their own way of thinking. And if you don't think the way they think, they're mad at you. I've, I've ministered to, in, in my first church, we had the great-great-granddaughter of Devil May Hatfield. So you can imagine what was in that church. I had a fight every time the coal mines went out on strike. We had them shooting at each other. So the reality of it is, Christians many times have an idea about things, and if it's not the way they think it ought to be, then they'll fight over it. All right, so chapter 8, very important chapter. Having said that, let's look then at verse 3 through 8. He said, knowledge alone is inadequate. Mac knows idols don't exist. Terry knows idols don't exist. But the reality is they still fight out back at the church because Mac doesn't think Terry ought to buy the lamb leg at the, out at the street for the cheap price. And they'll fight over it. All right. So now we come then to the second part of chapter 8. And that is love is indispensable. Knowledge alone is inadequate, but love is indispensable. So... Let's read our scripture together. Chapter 8, verse 3. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there be God's many and Lord's many. In other words, everywhere you turn, there are idols set up that are called God's and Lord's. He says, but to us, there is but one God. So Mac, you and Terry, get over it. There is but one God. I can see Jason now. Mac, did you really go to the worship idols? But to us there is but one God, the Father of whom all things, and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all are, uh, are all things, and we are by Him. Howbeit, 
There is not in every man that knowledge. In other words, everybody you meet is not going to see it that way. I took a course in a university called World Philosophical Literature, taught by a secular professor who said, we're all going up the same mountain just on different sides. Now, you and I both know that's not true. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But in that class, you'd have had a fight on your hands just to say that God is, there's only one God, and that one God is only approached by Jesus Christ. Now, that's a biblical conviction. But in that class, it was my preference. It was what I believe, but they didn't believe it. See what I'm saying? And that's what causes the difficulty. He says, Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with the conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered to an idol. And he says, And their conscience being weak is defiled. In other words, they give in because they, they like Terry. And they go out, they go to his house, and he's serving the leg of lamb. And so they say, well, I, I want to be Terry's best friend, so I'll sit down and eat it. And the whole time they're eating it, it's getting bigger and bigger in their mouth because they know where he bought it. Right? All right. So it says, and their conscience being weak is defiled, but me commendeth or gives us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, Neither if we eat not are we the worse. So the meat is not the problem, right? The meat's not the problem. He said, if you eat it, you're not better off. If you don't eat it, you're not better off. That's not the problem. He says, it's all a matter of love. The proud Corinthian needed to learn the importance of love. Verse number one. Love for God is essential, and God knows who loves Him, verse number 3 says. God knows who loves Him. The Greeks worshipped a lot of false gods, but Paul and the Corinthian believers knew that there was only one true God, verse number 4. Nevertheless, many imaginary gods commanded the pagans' devotion. In other words, all through the city, many Pagan gods would cause people to stop and to worship and to do the things they were do doing. And the demons, and this is important, verse 5 and even in chapter 10, verse 19 and 20, Paul says the demons were energizing the whole idolatrous religion. See, they had never been taught that, but even the devil was in that, all right? So many Christians at Corinth shared Paul's knowledge that the one true God controlled everything and created everything by the agency of Jesus Christ, verse number six. But these knowledgeable Christians needed to experience love toward new believers that were just beginning to learn. Follow me? These that had grown up in the church, been to Sunday school, had been to vacation Bible school and had learned all these things, <coughs> needed to be patient with those new Christians that were still confused and were beginning to grow in the Lord. Verse 6. Verse 7. And since the Corinthian Christians' relationship to God weren't affected either by eating the food or abstaining from the food, verse number 8, they needed to set a, a set of principles to guide their decisions with regard to the effects that eating the food had on believers. What are the principles? What are the things that we can honestly take a look at that would help us to be able to make those choices and to do the things that God would have us to do with new Christians that are coming into the church? Folks, this is a very important matter. Because so many times, you know, we would around here, we wouldn't argue about a leg of lamb that had been sacrificed in an, in an idolatry uh, uh, situation. But we do have our own very strong opinions about things. And so many times it keeps us from being friends or it keeps us from praying with someone or inviting people to church or sometimes even coming to church. 
because we're upset that David sang a song didn't have shape notes or uh, or it wasn't Southern Gospel or it was a Jesus is my boyfriend kind of a piece of music. And we get all upset about things that are not biblical conviction. Now, I'll, I'll argue, argue you to the mat if it's a biblical conviction, right? If the Bible says it. I'll argue, you tell me, I had one man told me in my office 20 years ago that his wife was sick and God told him it'd be okay to have an affair with the neighbor's wife because his wife couldn't take care of him. I argued him to the mat because I know what the Bible says. But many times we fuss and argue over things that are not scriptural, but a preference. So as we get into these principles, and I'm going to pick up with the, with the second part of this message next week about applying principles. It all starts in chapter 8, verse 9. In chapter 8, verse 9, all the way through chapter 10, he's going to give you a set of principles. Keep that piece of paper that you got, and we're going to take a look at it, finish it out, as we get into each one of these principles that he gives to us to be able to determine how we are to handle something if we disagree with somebody's feeling about it. I had a fellow in one of my previous churches, he was a, a career truck driver. Probably graduated from the third grade. I don't know that he ever went much past that. But he was determined, he's going to tell me how I had to pastor the church and that I wasn't doing it right. His name was Roy. And I said, Roy, let me tell you something. I have read a lot of books on driving 18-wheelers. I know how to change the wheels. I know how to, to adjust the seat. I know how to back them up. I know, because I read the book, Roy. I know what the book says. And if you ever want to know about how to drive your truck, just let me know. And if I ever need for you to tell me how to pastor the church, I'll get with you. Now, the reality of it is we all have an opinion. But there are principles that guide us when it comes to getting along over things that we might differ about. And I'm going to give you those principles next week. All right? I don't want to half get into it. I want us to be sure to concentrate on it. Because this is such an important passage of Scripture. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful, Lord, for the things that we've learned. We know the church at Corinth was having a very difficult time brought on because they didn't know how to handle the new Christians that were coming in without the background, without the period of time of growth. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to grow so much so that we'll not sin against our conscience but we'll have the principles by which we can help others <clears throat> to grow <coughs> in their spiritual knowledge of things that may not be right or wrong by biblical contract, but they may just hinder a weaker brother from growing in the Lord or dropping out altogether. Lord, give us wisdom as a church and as people in the church to apply the scriptures when we disagree. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.